You're listening to The Creation Academy, a weekly podcast and radio show defending the truth of God's Word in biblical creation science. I'm your host, Steve Schramm, and in this week's episode, we're talking about radiometric dating. What is radiometric dating, and how does it help us from a biblical perspective? Another question would be, can it help us from a biblical perspective, or is radiometric dating our enemy? And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a couple other things as well. And I don't have a guest on the show this week, but I'll go ahead and say up front, we are going to be using a lot of material from some really good creation geologists, uh, mainly this time from Dr. Andrew Snelling. He's known for his work um, with Answers in Genesis, known for his work on the Rape Project, also known for... Um, some pretty important discoveries um, as far as geology is concerned. Um, There's a certain unconformity, it's called. It's a geologic structure in the Grand Canyon. He's known for uh, coming up with that. And so this is definitely a very credible individual. He's written many books on the topic, contributed to many scientific papers. So I'm pretty excited to talk about Uh, Some of the things that I've been learning about radiometric dating and pass them on to you, um, maybe in a way that that you can understand. Um, You know, I realize that not everybody here is a scientist uh, that listens. Uh, Most of you aren't. If you were a scientist, you probably wouldn't listen to this show uh, because you already know everything that I'm telling. Um, And this show is for people who aren't scientists and who, who don't necessarily understand, but who want to have a better Uh, idea and understanding of the field of creation science and how it works. And so that's what we're doing on this show and in this episode. So let's dive right in. Now, uh, when we talk about radiometric dating, oftentimes we think of that as our number one enemy um, in this fight against evolution and millions of years as it relates to earth science, geology. And the reason for that is that the radiometric dating is the key driver in what gives us the assumptions for the millions of years. And in other words, when we're looking at this difference between creationist scientists and and scientists who would uh, be more in the mainstream and subscribe to theory of evolution and so forth, there are many different fields of study that um, seem to to correlate and and to give us this. But no doubt uh, this whole idea kind of got started in the 1700s and 1800s talking about this very issue. And I do want to give you a a brief history because I think that's important of how uh, some of these issues came to be. I want to show you how radiometric dating is used to be the number one driver in the in the millions of years factor. And then I want to show you how if we easily just use a different underlying assumption, we can come up with dates that make sense from a biblical time scale. And somewhere in the mix of things, I'd like to talk about the assumptions that go into radiometric dating itself. And I find that interesting. See, assumptions in worldviews really, really matter. Where you start from, where you build that foundation from, has got everything to do with how you interpret the evidence. And so that is what really makes radiometric dating to be the number one um, problem, I would say, uh, in the millions of years um, controversy or, or, or debate. That would probably be the number one thing. So how did this get started? Well, radiometric dating didn't get started in the 1700s. On the contrary, uh, it only came about in the 1900s. I think uh, around 1902, I, I could be wrong, on that, but it's pretty close to there. Uh, somewhere between 1902 and 19, 1905, somewhere in there is when the radiometric dating really uh, began to come on the scene. But before that, there was already this relative dating 
in process. And um, where this sprung about was in uh, 1785, a gentleman by the name of James Hutton uh, proposed this self-maintaining infinite cycle kind of based on natural history and not on the biblical account. And, and I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, okay? I mean, I, I understand that, uh, you know, we fight against principalities and against powers, you know what I mean? We, we uh, I, you know, I'm not going to necessarily say that one person had, had this specific agenda or, or whatever, um, but there are definitely those who say that uh, Mr. Hutton was instrumental in um, establishing this idea of what we call uniformitarianism. And again, you know, that may or may not have been uh, something that he meant to do as a means of discrediting the Bible, um, but I have had that uh, uh, told to me. I've, I've heard many speak on that, and, and I haven't looked into that anymore, uh, not because I'm not interested in whether or not it's true, just that it's not really relevant to the kind of um, creation ministry I do. Uh, I'm less about tearing down evolution and more in the camp of trying to figure out an alternative solution that makes sense. Uh, the old saying goes, you know, it doesn't matter if you uh, can can prove that somebody is wrong. If you don't give them a better uh, theory to move to or, or an alternative uh, that makes sense for them, it's less likely that they're going to change. And so, and so that's where I stay. So I don't typically mess with that. But uh, the traditional history that I have heard goes something like this. Basically, James Hutton proposed this idea in 1785. Um, he was an influencer of a, of a guy named by Charles Lyell, or Lyell, I've heard that said both ways, and supposedly he was one of the main ones to introduce this idea that was um, built off of the uniformitarian assumption that James Hutton introduced, and it's called the, uh, the geologic column. Now, there's a little bit more nuance to that, which we'll get to in a minute, but, but that was kind of introduced in the 1830s and the principles of geology. And that was kind of this idea. And so, uh, of course, Darwin was heavily influenced by this Lyle guy as well. And so there's, there's, a, there's a play going on there. But essentially what happens is, you know, the geologists have, have found that in certain rock layers there are um, fossils that are present. And these fossils are present in each one of the rock layers pretty much universally across uh, the globe. Now, the truth of the matter is that if this actual geologic column, like the one we see in the textbooks, were all together in one place worldwide, it would be over 100 miles thick. So, needless to say, this does not uh, exist totally. But based on a process that they call relative dating, uh, which is very relative, it's, 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 it's almost circular, um, but basically all it means is that before there was radiometric dating, they could not give um, absolute dates to anything. And my argument is that they still can't. But, but the, the general argument was that before radiometric dating, there was no such thing as an absolute date in the ground, even though this idea was introduced. And the idea is that the older down you go into the rock layers, essentially the older the earth is. And basically they identify certain fossils, they call them index fossils, that help to date those layers as well. And, and the fossils then are are said to be in whatever layer the rock is found in, and vice versa. And so it sounds kind of circular, and it is kind of circular, but the idea is not that it has an absolute date. The idea in relative dating is just that um, said rock is older or younger than another rock layer. And same thing with fossils. And so that's kind of how that works. And uh, that can be called the biostratigraphic column, biostratigraphic column. And what that simply means is that's a column that is detailing what fossils we find in which rock layer. That's kind of how that works. And in the 1900s, radiometric dating came on the scene to kind of form the geologic, or I'm sorry, the chronologic column, the chronologic column. And the way that works is basically they've done these radiometric dating tests on the different layers, 
and on some of the different fossils. And they have found that different fossils and different layers date in, you know, different ways. And again, the findings are still consistent. The, the older that, or I'm sorry, the farther that you go down, essentially the older that uh, the rocks and fossils appear to be. And so this is where, if you combine the findings of the biostratigraphic column and the chronologic column, you come up with what is now known and um, loved as the geologic column. And the geologic column is said to be one of the prime evidences for deep time. And by virtue of that fact, evolution, therefore discrediting the literal reading of the Bible in a six-day creation uh, just a little over 6,000 years ago. So that is the challenge that we face. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not going to have time on this podcast to lay it out, and to be honest with you, it's more of a visual thing um, anyway, so it might be hard to explain if I tried, but the general idea is that if you actually look at the biostratigraphic column, if you look at the rock layers, and you look at the supposed order of things and the time periods that we see things um, occurring and the kinds of animals that we see occurring in the order that we do and the kinds of uh, different fossils altogether occurring in the order that we do, if you transpose a biblical time scale over that biostratigraphic column, all of the math and all of the data work out to form a 6,000 year, give or take, time frame with a catastrophic global flood. Let me kind of repeat that again. If you replace the radiometric dating assumption of uniformitarianism, if you get rid of that assumption and you instead use the Bible as your dating method, the data line up perfectly. Perfectly. In fact, it could not line up more perfectly. And I was just um, amazed watching this one of the guys that, that who I really learned this from, his name is Dr. Kurt Wise. He studied actually under the famous Stephen Jay Gould, the famous uh, paleontologist who um, was who rejected uniformitarianism in favor of the punctuated equilibrium theory, um, as far as his paleontological work goes. And so I encourage you to check out this video. If it's still up by the time you're listening to this, you can go to the Is Genesis History Facebook. Is Genesis History. It's the Facebook account associated with the movie that came out a while ago. And they've got clips on there from the Is Genesis History uh, uh, conference. And you can buy um, on their website the whole thing for $10, or you can watch some of them on the videos on Facebook, on their Facebook account. And one of them is from Dr. Kurt Wise. And the name of the video is uh, something to the effect of the um, time, D- does the age of the earth matter, or, or you know, is the age of the earth significant? And, uh, and maybe I can link to that in the show notes. But basically, it takes you through just this perfect understanding of how the biblical time frame makes perfect and absolute sense when transposed over the biostratigraphic column. And so really what we're dealing with here is the product of just having two completely different worldviews. We see that the evidence and the data completely support and line up with the Bible if we use the Bible as our starting point. But if we start from naturalistic assumptions and if we start with the assumption that things are millions of years old, then you're not going to arrive at the correct conclusion or at least what we believe is the correct conclusion as the biblical conclusion. Now, knowing what we know, and again, that video is an hour long, and it is an hour well spent. You'll learn all kinds of great things. You also find a similar explanation of this in the um, iconic work Scientific Creationism 
by Dr. Henry Morris. Uh, that's an incredible book as well, and it talks a little bit about this too. So I encourage you to, to check that out. But if we look at the actual facts, right? Just the facts, ma'am. You know, that's, how, that's all I want, just the facts. If we look at the facts and the hard data, the hard evidence, we know for a fact that these uh, rock layers are there, right? We can observe those rock layers. Those rock layers are there, and um, if you didn't know any better, if you were not assuming a global flood, you would definitely come to the conclusion that these guys were laid down over millions of years. I mean, there are some issues with that, erosion marks in between, you know. I mean, there are definitely some issues with that where where maybe we're jumping to conclusions on that. But the fact of the matter is, is that these rock layers are distinct. Um, there's different mega sequences. They're laid down one over the other. That is a fact. All right, it's also a fact that we find these fossils in the rocks and any time that we find a certain part of what we call the geologic column, we find that those fossils are in the correct layers. They're where they should be, and it definitely appears that um, the organisms go from very simple to extremely complex the further up you go. And so to just dismiss this idea as being um, as being dumb or, or as being unintelligent would be a mistake on the part of the creationist because it's very easy to see how somebody who is not looking at things with biblical eyes could could really understand this from this perspective. It's it's very easy to see that when looking at it somewhat objectively. So those are the facts. Okay, we we know those are the facts now. This is a pretty simple equation, okay? We've got, we've got one set of facts on the right, one set of facts on the left. So we've got the, the rock layers and we've got the fossils. And then in the middle, to reconcile those together in order to form the geologic column, we have this radiometric dating um, convention. This, this idea where we can uh, date what we call isotopes, radioisotope dating, that's another way to put it, uh, where we can date these rocks and these fossils supposedly in a way that is absolute. In other words, when we carry out this kind of dating, we are supposing that we can find the absolute date you know, within a certain degree of these rocks or of these fossils. And there are five or six, uh, you know, four or five, six pretty commonly used uh, methods of radiometric dating for, for things like this, um, rocks in particular. Uh, so potassium argon is pretty common. Uh, uranium dating, there's two kinds of uranium dating. Those are pretty... Um, pretty common. There are uh, a couple others. They're, they're escaping me right now, but, but those are, those are pretty common. There's lead, um, uranium and lead. So, so those are pretty common. Um, but probably, probably potassium argon is, is one of the, one of the key, uh, dating methods used in, in this practice. Now, if the, the facts are incorrect, or the facts are correct, then really the radiometric dating is the only thing that's left that could be that could be wrong. And so uh, for that then, we have to now start to look at the radiometric dating and see, well, is this what's messing with us? Is this what's mess messing with our times? And I think if we're intellectually honest, and I can't think of, of, of a mainstream biologist who would not admit this, uh, we're getting our dates from the radiometric dating, the millions of years as far as absolute dates is coming in because of this radiometric dating. And I got to tell you, it's pretty convincing because as I mentioned earlier, when you go down the geologic column, the ages are getting seemingly older. And this is consistent everywhere. I mean, this is you know, this is not pseudoscience. These are these are real numbers, real you know, real data, real numbers. And so, it, 
what we have to question is, is the method right? Is the method right? And we find that radiometric dating, and again, this will not be comprehensive. We only have a few minutes left, but I really kind of wanted to at least give you this uh, idea of radiometric dating as it relates to the assumptions versus the Bible. But radiometric dating is an assumption that factors into every new line of, of, of testing that is done against these, um, you know, fossils and, and, and things like that. In other words, when we're doing science or when scientists are doing science to uh, make new predictions about the way things were, whether it be the evolutionary time scale, something to do with dinosaurs and fossils and stuff like that, this radiometric dating that we're talking about right now is an assumption that they feed into those numbers. But as I told you in the beginning, this radiometric dating convention on itself has three built-in assumptions of its own. And these three assumptions are pretty problematic for the reliability of radiometric dating as it relates to absolute numbers. And here's what they are. Assumption number one is that we know how many atoms of uh, whichever element were in the rock when it formed. In other words, um, the way that radiometric dating works, just to give you a basic idea, is you have got parent isotopes and daughter isotopes. And so the decay rate is calculated by uh, basically looking at how many of the parent isotopes have turned into daughter isotopes. And so there's ways to, to measure that out. And basically, you can kind of do the math on the difference and figure out what the age might be. And the assumption built into that is the fact that decay rates are the same in the past as they are today. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's another assumption. But, but so understand that the way this works is that you've got parents and you've got daughters. And the ratio between the two kind of helps us determine um, you know, uh, what the age of it might be. Okay, so assumption number one is that we know how many atoms of the daughter isotope were in the rock when it formed. In other words, for these, uh, as, you know, for this dating method to work, the first assumption that they work on is presumably that there was no or none of the daughter isotopes in the rock when it was formed. So in the case of potassium argon dating for instance so potassium would be the parent isotope argon would be the daughter isotope and so they would assume when they are doing this potassium argon test on a rock that the potassium was the only isotope in the rock that there was none of the argon and so they're looking at the ratio of potassium to argon now they're doing the math but they're starting with the assumption that we know how many there were of the potassium to start with and that there were none of the argon. And so if you, if, if, if you got to understand that, um, that's a crazy assumption. And the reason that's a crazy assumption is that it's disproven by something that geologists call inheritance. Inheritance, And I, I'm not going to give you all the examples, probably not going to give you any on, on this podcast. We might follow this up with a secondary podcast talking about some of these examples of where these methods have failed. In fact, we probably will do that. But to start with, we need to see that, that inheritance, this concept of inheritance, disproves potassium-argon dating. Um, as far as this first assumption into it, excuse me, not, it doesn't disprove potassium-argon dating, but it does uh, take away some of the reliability of this first assumption that's in there uh, because we find plenty of examples where inheritance um, caused an issue. And basically what that means is that uh, there are very many scenarios across the globe where newly formed rock has both the potassium and the argon in it to start with because it was inherited from the source of the magma that turned into the rock. 
if that makes some sense to you. So it was inherited from the source. And we, one of the shining examples of that was in the Grand Canyon. There was some lava flow in the Grand Canyon to uh, two volcanoes, one supposedly older and one supposedly younger. But they were getting the same exact date when you looked at potassium argon dating. But we knew that one was older and one was younger by observation. We understood that. And so when we look at this, we saw that they both were getting the same date. And that didn't really make any sense until we looked at the source. We went into the volcano and did some testing inside of there. And we found that the source of the magma is what gave this property to the rocks. It wasn't the age that was being reflected, in other words. It was the composition of the source. And so that's something that's called inheritance, and it's commonly found in rocks of known age, right? So there, and again, I told you there's multiple examples. You can look this up online. There's multiple examples. And we all the time are seeing rocks that we know what the ages are, and yet, they're giving us inconsistent dating. And the reason is because of this inheritance. We're finding that it has the daughter isotopes in with it many more than would be assumed under conventional dating. So the idea is that if this is the case in known age rocks, why should we expect it to be any different in rocks that we don't know the age and we're using this as the dating method? So when we're looking at it and we're saying, hey, this is an indicator of the age in the conventional paradigm, it may actually just be a, a indication of the complex or the, um, the complexion or the, the makeup of the source. So that's assumption number one. And we find that it is very unreliable. So assumption number two, assumption number two, in the workings of radiometric dating is that no outside forces altered the parent-daughter relationship used by the dating method. And so that's quite an assumption to make, especially when you consider that under conventional dating, we're talking about millions and millions of years. I mean, billions of years, uh, you know, really. So we're talking millions and millions and millions of years. And so um, it's unreasonable to believe that there was no contamination, cross-contamination from different isotopes and from different uh, magma flow spots and things like that that would not contaminate this and like i said it is disproven now by a process that is known as contamination and so that is again where some of these other isotopes and elements get in the way and they actually converge on this uh, particular rock that we're trying to do the test on and so therefore we are not getting an accurate rating of the date. We're simply seeing evidence that there was contamination in the isotopes. And again, this is something that we find commonly in rocks of known age. We know this. We've seen this time and time again. And again, you can find more examples of this. I'm sure if you Google Dr. Andrew Snelly, he has got plenty of examples of this going on. And so we see that that this second assumption that no outside forces uh, are going to alter the parent-daughter relationship in the isotopes, that just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we know that that's not right. So assumption number three, and this is the, this is the kicker, the present is the key to the past. Assumption number three that is built into radiometric dating is indeed that the decay rates in the past are exactly the same as they are Today, that's an assumption that needs to work right in order for radiometric dating to work right. And the fact is that this is yet again disproven in many cases by what we call accelerated decay rates. And these accelerated decay rates um, are determined with a process that actually tests a rock or a sample with all major radioisotope methods, the most common four, and what we expect and what the, what the textbooks and what the scientific literature tells us is that we can expect all of these dating methods to yield the same results. And so some tests were carried out in which they went ahead and took some of these rock samples and tested them, right? And, and, and did it with all four tests. And what we found 
is they consistently gave a different age each dating method. And what is is further fascinating is that it was always in that specific sequence, a specific order, starting with potassium uh, argon, uh, uh, potassium argon, excuse me, dating, which gave the lowest numbers each time. And it was in a specific sequence each time. So those are the three assumptions that are built in. And again, that last one is disproven in many cases by these accelerated decay rates because what we found is that the different... Um, the different radioisotopes actually decay at these different rates. And we found that by testing with all four of the same, uh, or all four of the dating methods on the rocks. And so we've tried that. Uh, we know and understand it doesn't work. And we have reasons to believe, which we won't go into right now, but we have reasons from flood geology to believe that these uh, rates were definitely different under catastrophic processes. you got to understand we're talking about these catastrophic processes going on to um, make the flood take place and break open the fountains of the deep. And these were processes that would be natural if done at their natural rates as we observe them today. But under the biblical model, God accelerated those uh, in order to bring some of those events about. And so this assumption... There's really just no reason to believe it. There's nothing that tells us that uh, the decay rates have to be the same as they've always been. That's, that's just simply uh, an assumption. So, you know, in summary then, what we're really doing here is, is we're seeing that when you take the assumptions that feed the main assumption that challenges the biblical worldview, uh, and we find that they are unreliable and, and, and un, you know, untrustworthy at, at best, that should really encourage you in your, in your Christian faith. And again, you know, on this podcast, I, my goal is not to, to tear down evolutionists or, or, or their ideas. As a matter of fact, what we found is that radiometric dating could be very useful uh, even in the further um, construction of creation models, simply because, you know, it, it, it does prove that, you know, some relative dating, it, it always works right as far as helping us to prove whether things are older or younger. But you know, the reality is that relative dating, it, it, at least to some degree, is what we had before radiometric dating came along. And so the fact of the matter is that this was kind of the... Uh, I guess the straw that broke the camel's back, uh, in some ways, it was the one. It was the one piece of science that um, really helped the case for uniformitarianism, and really helped um, people to to get away from from the need for a creator. You know, it was quite frankly, you'll find different schools of thought on this, but the reality is that. Uh, before this point, the best explanation that anyone had was God. And so, you know, of course, we're in a different place now. You know, over a century later, you know, people think that, that we're using God of the gap arguments at this point and just filling in the information that we don't know and just, just cleaving and just hanging on uh, to the Bible. But the reality is that if you say the Bible is unreliable, as a skeptic, I don't really see a reason that I, as a Christian, can't just say that your assumptions uh, for for dating are unreliable because, as a matter of fact, the evidence just proves that, that they are. And um, it's just amazing. We've got these rocks of, of known age that are just dating outrageously. A, a couple examples. I could think of one that... Uh, We've got rocks that are dating millions and millions of years in one dating method, and then the next dating method, if we apply to that same specimen, is showing literally negative millions of years. And and so that's not accurate. And, and then we've got some examples of things where we know the age, right? We're, uh, we're aware of the age because of observation of something, and then we date it, and we just get these astronomical numbers. And uh, again, the Rate Project is great. Check out the Rate Project by ICR. Um, it's this study they've done that gives us five lines of evidence. I've only given you one today. But this gives you five lines of evidence across other radioisotope dating methods that just um, 
very conclusively prove that this is just not a dating method that should be reliable as as it's considered in relative to absolute dating. It, it's just the fact of the matter is there's no proof that radiometric dating can give us an absolute number. It's just not what we observe. And so therefore, I think that as Christians, we are warranted in our pursuit of using the Bible as our starting assumption. And again, like I've said, uh, we can do the research on this sometime or, 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 or we can present it to you. But the reality is, is that the geologic column completely, I mean, the way things are sorted, it just completely lines up with what we would expect in a global flood. And as I told you earlier, check out Kurt Wise on that. Check out uh, Scientific Creationism by Henry Morris. And you're going to find that. So let me encourage you as, as we leave for today to do some independent research on that. Again, Henry Morris, Scientific Creationism. Uh, Kurt Wise, check out his video on Facebook that I told you about. Check out the RATE Project. R-A-T-E stands for the Radioisotope uh, Dating Methods in the Age of the Earth uh, by uh, a company called ICR. And Dr. Andrew Snelling definitely helped out with that and, and, and was key in that. And do your own research on these things and see see what happens. Now, you'll find that the scientific community at large just kind of laughs this away. Um, and uh, they haven't really, I mean, there, there's some explainers for a few things, and I think they're warranted. I mean, there's definitely some situations where uh, where the radiometric dating could be, could be accurate. But in most cases that we observe, at least in these tests that were done, it, it's just simply not. And, and it's just not, not a reliable method. So do your research on that. And, um, and plan to join us back next week. Hey, I'd appreciate it if you'd tell your friends about this podcast. It is a new podcast. We are trying to get as much content out there as we possibly can. Uh, but we're moving slow. Got a family here and, uh, you know, full-time job and, and doing some blogging and stuff, but but check us out anyway. If you want to check out our blog, sign up for our email list. You can go out there at steveschram.com, and you can find how to spell that on the podcast artwork or in the show notes, steveschram.com, and um, you can see our blog there, the podcast there. Sign up for our email list. We'll give you a free four-lesson email course called Defend Your Faith with Confidence. Takes you right through the four things that you need to know, the four objections that you need to have an answer for uh, when you're looking at defending Christianity in a conversation with somebody. So I think that will be a really, really helpful tool to you. Pray you'd keep up with us and uh, like us, subscribe to the podcast. You know, I mean, just, just spread the word. We're really trying to, to spread the positive case for creation science. And we want to get this in front of as many people as we can. So pray you'll help me and join this movement. And hey, I just want to say a little prayer for you today. I encourage you to send prayer requests into the contact form on the website. Uh, and we'll gladly pray for you here on the podcast. So let's go ahead and end this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you so much for just allowing us to gather together in this format, Lord, and uh, and to, to learn things about your creation. Lord, we're so thankful for everything that you've done for us, for everything that you give to us. And though we're so undeserving, Lord, we're sure grateful for your wonderful and marvelous grace and for your for your creation. Father, as we go now, I pray you'll help us to take what we've heard this week and apply it to our lives. Help us to learn more about it. Help us to share it with others that we might be able to defend our faith ever more confidently in this culture that we're facing. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next week here on The Creation Academy.